When the news of Prophet Sallallahu message started spreading on the outskirts of Mecca, towns and villages that were not part of Mecca, but they were in the outskirts, started hearing about this ruckus that was taking place in Mecca. They were not sure what was going on. It was not clear who this person was. Is he a sorcerer? Is he a magician? He's breaking households. And all different propaganda that the Quraysh was doing, the marketing campaign that the Quraysh were doing against Prophet ﷺ started spreading in the Arabian Peninsula. <coughs> And as it spread, it arrived at the doorsteps of Banu Ghifar, a tribe in the Arab Peninsula. The person in Banu Ghifar, a young man, he heard and he would keenly listen to the news that was coming from the caravans that would pass through his tribe in the valley of Wadan. And he would hear, oh, okay, he's like that. Oh, he's a sorcerer. And he got so many mixed news that he got confused. And he wanted to kill his confusion by certainty. Many times in life, when you're confused, your soul desires the element of certainty so it can be at rest. Likewise, this man, he goes to his brother named Anis and he tells him, Anis, I need you to do a favor. Why don't you go to Mecca for a day or two? Check out this man. And in the meantime, I'll take care of your family, but I can't leave because I I'm the leader here in the tribe and I have many things to take care of. So his brother goes and he's to Mecca, but unfortunately he doesn't get a chance to meet Prophet ﷺ. But he hears some verses. He hears the message of Allah. And he comes back <coughs> to his elder brother and tells him that I didn't get a chance to meet him. But people say a lot of things about him. My brother, I myself am a poet, Arabic shair. Wallahi, what he says is not poetry. It's something beyond poetry that we have never heard. Then, this young man, he can't take it anymore. He says, how about you take care of my family and the tribe? And I myself, I'm going to go and attain certainty in this matter. So he arrives in Mecca. And upon his arrival in Mecca, he's in the Haram, in the Kaaba. And he's looking where Muhammad is. Bear in mind that this was a time when the Quraysh were attacking every believer. Bilal was being prosecuted. Many of the other Sahabas were being prosecuted at that time if they were slaves. So they were not open. Prophet ﷺ was not out in public. He was hiding in Darul Arqam. Ali radiallahu an <coughs> sees the man in the courtyard of Haram and he goes up to him and he says, what brings you here? I am Ali ibn Abi Talib. I am Ali. What's your name? The person replies, My name is Aba Dhar. Abu Dhar al Ghifari. My name is Aba Dhar from the Ghifar tribe. He says, What are you here for? Abu Dhar does not reply to him because he's scared. Quraysh are not friends with Al Ghifar tribe. They have head-to-head -head animosity amongst them. Abu Dhar says, I'm here for something. Ali radiallahu anh invites him to his house, provides him dinner, and he lets him sleep as a guest in the house. The next day, Abu Dhar takes some water, some dates, and he heads out on the streets of Mecca looking for Prophet ﷺ. Once again, all he's hearing is the latest news. Oh, so, uh, a father of so-and-so has put him into chains. A uh, slave of so-and-so, his master is beating him on the corner. He's just hearing news about prosecution of Muslims, but he, don't, he can't find Prophet ﷺ. So Ali sees him again the second day and takes him home, feeds him. 
Then the third day, same thing happens. Ali radiallahu takes him home. And then Abu Dhar says, I'm getting nowhere like this. I need to tell someone what I'm here for. Abu Dhar takes that all courage, that he, all the courage that he had and opens the conversation with Ali radiallahu anhu. Ali, mind you, at that time is only a teenager. He's not an adult. And he says, I'm here to look for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ali radiallahu anhu sparked with joy. He says, I knew it. From the time you came into our house, I knew that you were here for to see Prophet sallallahu You were here for something much greater. And you've come to the right place. In the morning, they planned. It's a long story. They planned how they're going to get to the house of Prophet ﷺ without anybody on the streets figuring out that, you know, Ali and Abu Dhar are following one another. Finally, they, achieve, they arrive at the house of Prophet ﷺ. <clears throat> and the minute he looks at Prophet ﷺ, his heart says, this is not a face of a liar. This is not a face of a liar. And he's already accepted Islam inside. Then he takes shahada openly. And he tells Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahi, I'm going to go into Haram in the Kaaba, where the Quraysh are sitting. And I'm going to tell every single person out loud who I am. And I have accepted Islam. Prophet Sallallahu said, Do not do that. Do not do that. But despite that, Prophet Sallallahu told him not to do it, he went out and he did it. <coughs> Obviously, when he announced his Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah, the Quraysh took him, they started beating him up. In the midst of all this, you know, they were, they were, they were beating him. Abbas radiallahu anh comes and says, do you know who this person is? This is Abu Dharr, Jundab. This is the leader of Ghifar. And all your caravans, they go through the valley of Wadan. And if you do anything wrong to him, rest assured that you'll be left with no trade. Because your caravans won't be able to leave Makkah without crossing this valley. So they let Abu Dharr go. He came back to Prophet ﷺ. And Prophet ﷺ told him, I told you, I told you, that this is not the right time. I'll tell you when the right time is. Insha'Allah, Allah is going to give me victory in this land. And when you hear about me conquering this land, then come. And that would be the right time. Abu Dhar radiallahu an was one of the greatest Sahabis that ever lived. He was known for his zuhud. He had no place for dunya in his heart. So much so that he would make life very difficult for people living around him. His iman level was so high that during the reign of Umar, he asked him to live outside the, Medi outside the city. Because people would be really, like he, he was so high in his iman that every little thing was a mistake for him. And he could not stop but to tell the person, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And that's all he did when he would enter Medina. And then Umar requested that, you know what, you are a different league and you will just stay outside Medina, come for salah and just leave. And we find this from the hadith of Prophet ﷺ that Abu Dhar, Prophet ﷺ said about him, <clears throat> that he was born alone. He lived alone. He shall die alone and he will be resurrected on the day of judgment alone. I.e. he will be himself an ummah. When he died, he was in the middle of the desert, only his wife and his son. And a caravan was passing by and they asked him to bury him, so they buried him. He's not buried amongst any humanity somewhere in the desert. And on the day of judgment, when he's going to be resurrected, there's going to be nobody around him, just himself. And that was... Because he was so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we learn from this story are many, many lessons. We don't have a time to go through all of them, but let's try to capture as many as we can. The first lesson that we get is notice how 
Abu Dhar could have easily stayed in his village or in his town. He's the leader of the tribe. I don't have any reason to go and figure out what's going on. I mean, I'm set. I am the leader. People follow me. Why do I need to even bother? You see, people that do not have this ability to constantly change themselves, they become stagnant in their lives. You find them after 10 years, and he's working in the same job with the same pay, same house, same car. Nothing has changed in their lives. You see, if you do not change as an individual, just one of these days, look around you. And you shall find that everything around you, this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this dunya, everything changes. Today I'm here giving khutbah, 100 years later somebody else is going to be giving khutbah. I won't be here. Today you're here listening to the khutbah, 100 years later you won't be here. There is constant change in this dunya. It's in front of our eyes. But sometimes we get so busy with our lives that we forget to change for the better. See, Muslim is always in a struggle of changing two things. Changing himself so that he can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in a constant struggle of changing his bad habits and adopting new ones. If we let go of these two struggles, then the road for us is just downhill. One of my teachers, she had beautifully explained to me and she said that life for a believer is as if you are going on a journey on top of a mountain and you're pushing a cart. And what happens is if you keep pushing the cart upwards, only then can you sustain and you can guarantee that you will make it to the top. But the minute you stop that cart, you become stagnant, you became, become stationary, what happens? That cart becomes heavier and heavier. You can hold it for a while, but eventually you will start coming down. And this is the example of a believer in this dunya. We're on an uphill road, constantly pushing our cart upwards. And we can't stop for a single second. Why can't we stop? Because our counter is constantly running. The angel is constantly riding. The angel does not take a lunch break. The angel does not go for a dinner so you can relax. He's there 24-7 until the day you and I leave this world. So change. Be consistent in your change. Keep in mind that change sometimes does not mean that you become a different person over one night. Sometimes change, if you know angles, if you've taken any geometry, and if you take two lines and you make a one degree angle over here, the impact down the road is going to be a lot more. The distance that you're going to create down the road is going to be a lot more. But over here, if you just made a one degree change, you're going to be like, it's only one degree. But keep that one degree for a good three, four, five years down the road, that one degree. This is you in the past and this would be you in the future. So when we're talking about change, it's maybe half a page of the Quran a week. Not even a day. But stick to it. It's maybe adding one extra sunnah in your salah once a week. And stick to it. And see what happens is, when we are in the process of change towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah's help come to us. So you pray one, and Allah gives you tawfiq for a second. You pray two, Allah gives you tawfiq for four. What is Allah looking for? That you are struggling towards getting closer to Him. You pay, read one page a day, Allah will give you tawfiq tomorrow to read two pages a day. Wallahi, if you try this, your heart will feel it that one day you'll be reading and you'll be like, let me read another page. Your heart will say that to you. You won't have to, nobody, no parents, no, no teacher, no manager would have to tell you do this. Your heart is going to say, let me do another two rakahs. Let me do another 
dhikr tasbih. Hundred times, subhanallah. You will finish, subhanallah, your heart will say, let me do alhamdulillah another hundred times. You will finish, alhamdulillah, your heart will say, Allahu Akbar. And the more you do it, the more your physical and spiritual body starts becoming congruent. They start aligning. They start connecting with one another. So your salah, my salah does not become just a mere ritual. It becomes a source of joy for us. It becomes a source of happiness for us. And that is in a short, like in a nutshell, what change should mean to every single person. Notice how Abu Dhar Ghifari took that journey, went to Mecca. After that, one came back home. In his tribe, he made the whole tribe Muslim. Then he didn't stop right there. He would constantly come to Prophet ﷺ, learn knowledge, sat with the scholars, sahabas, kept learning knowledge. He was, it's asked about him, that it's told about him that he used to ask a lot of questions. Who asks questions? People who are looking for answers. And who are the people that are looking for answers? People who are looking to change. If you don't have any questions in life, then that's one of the greatest or one of the biggest signs that you're headed towards stagnation. You're headed towards a stationary platform. Be very, very careful about that. Another lesson that we learn over here is notice how Prophet ﷺ, he told Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar, do not go and tell Quraysh about your Islam. But despite that, he went. Okay? And this is something that today Awamun Nas, the, the general public, needs to understand. That when Prophet ﷺ, when we pick up a hadith book, when we pick up, pick up a seerah book, if Prophet ﷺ makes a command, there are two types of commands. One command that he gives is a command when he gave as a Nabi. It's a command that Prophet ﷺ gave as a Nabi. And there are other commands that Prophet ﷺ gave that, were, that was as an insan, that was as a human being giving a normal advice to other person. And I'll give you some examples about that. Because many times what happens is, person picks up the hadith, Bukhari or Muslim, look, Prophet says, do not do this. Okay? The word nahi, or the negation in Arabic language, has more than 10 meanings. When you say the word, do not do that, it could mean this, it could mean there's 10 different ways you can interpret that one negation. And it's not up to me, and it's not up to us. To decide from the book of hadiths what is not to do, and it's not up to us. We're not qualified for that. For example, in this case, Prophet says, do not do it. Sahaba did it. Prophet Abu Dhar did it. Prophet did not come back and say, you know what? Why didn't you listen to me? I commanded you. It was just like, I told you about the consequences, didn't I? Another time, Prophet got up. Ali radiallahu anhu had decided that he's going to get married to the daughter of Abu Jahl. Prophet ﷺ got up and he gave a khutbah and he said, لا يجتمع تحت سخف واحد بنت نبي وبنت فرعون هذا النبي That you cannot have a daughter of a prophet and a daughter of Fir'aun of this ummah under one roof. That's not legislation of Islam. That is Prophet ﷺ acting as a father. Another time at Badr, Prophet ﷺ said, we're going to station over here. One of the Sahabis came and he said, أَمْرًا is it a command like as a prophet? Or is it warfare? Prophet said, but this is warfare. Then he challenged Prophet ﷺ. He said, This is not the place where you should station. From my idea, we should go into that place. And Prophet ﷺ, when he looked at, looked at his advice, he said, he's right. I was wrong. So be very careful when you pick up a hadith book when somebody says, look, this is a hadith of Prophet ﷺ, he's saying, do not do that. And you see in somebody else doing the exact opposite of that. Don't go and take that hadith. It's a hadith, it says that. Because you may not know that there might be seven other hadiths that talk opposite to that. In order for any person to give, whether this is allowed or not, a verdict, you must encompass all the verses 
and all the ahadiths that are talked about this particular issue and compare all of them and their levels and then come to a verdict. And that is something me and you and all of us are not capable of. So we should leave that to scholars. We should have scholars that you should, whoever you feel comfortable with, adhere to one scholar. You have any ikhtilafat, go back to him. Do not get into these unnecessary arguments. I see this all the time in my office. People discussing things and the guy does not even know how to pray salah. Allah is not going to ask me whether on this particular issue about belief in this particular subject, where do I stand? But Allah will definitely ask me on the day of judgment, how was my salah? Did I waste my time? Let's get concerned with ourselves like Abu Dhar Ghifari. Let's get inspired with his life that it's about me and me in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and my akhirah. And then when you have enough ulama, enough scholars vouching for your ilm, for your status, for your iman, then you can have that ability to come and tell people this is haram or this is not. And that is one of the reasons every, if you've noticed every time anybody asks me a fiqh question, I simply say I do not know. Because I am not a faqih. I may have an answer, but my answer might be limited. So it's also important for people standing on the, on the, the mimbars or talking and giving dua. If, if you are giving you know, advices to Muslim community, that know your abilities and don't go beyond that. Because speaking on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the greatest sins. Saying that this is a hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Prophet sallallahu said, let that person prepare his seat in hellfire. And it's a very scary thing. So be very careful about that. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِلِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّهُ